Hello everyone and welcome back to another day of the 2021 AUA virtual meeting where once again thousands of experts in urology and urologic care have come together to share the latest in their field. My name is Atria Godfrey and I am here to bring you the latest from each day of the virtual meeting. Today we'll be taking a closer look at the Global Humanitarian Recognition Award. This will encourage people at different stages of their career to get out and to, to serve in communities within the United States, but also in underserved countries. Dive deep into the work the AUA is doing globally. Finally, I would like to share that I, along with the three AUA assistant secretaries, have been keeping engaged with our international society partners by holding virtual leadership meetings so that we can check in on our friends and partners. Highlight plenary sessions taking place today. And I'm truly honored to give the 2021 Latimer Lecture where I will talk about the future directions in medical stone management. And taking you on a tour of teams around the world that are leading in the field of urology. First, we stay in the studio to talk to Dr. Nagler, the president of the Urology Care Foundation, and Dr. DeVries, the recipient of the Global Humanitarian Recognition Award. We are now joined in the studio by Dr. Nagler and Dr. DeVries. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Happy to be here. Let's start with you, Dr. Nagler. What is the Global Humanitarian Recognition Award? That is the award that recognizes individuals who have demonstrated a commitment to humanitarian efforts by improving the health care for underserved minorities throughout the world. And Dr. DeVries, how does it feel to be the recipient of the Global Humanitarian Recognition Award? Oh, I am so honored. It's, it's really a thrill. And, you know, I think it um, is especially important because it anchors within the AUA this value that I think so many of us shared about humanitarian outreach to uh, people not just within the United States, but around the world within the structure of the AUA. So personally, I feel honored, but I feel especially happy that the AUA has chosen this. And Dr. Nagler, what will you be highlighting in your lecture? So the lecture at the plenary session is designed to update our members about what the Urology Care Foundation is, what we represent, and where we're going. In the last several years since the Urology Care Foundation is committed to becoming a global organization, looking like and behaving like a global organization, one of our important initiatives is to make sure that our educational materials are available in languages other than English. The last thing I'm going to talk about is our new humanitarian efforts. We've really just embarked on this. We are trying to show to the urologic community, to the world, that urologists and the AUA and Urology Care Foundation values these activities. In conjunction with that, we're going to talk a little bit about our diversity and inclusion initiatives. It became apparent to us that you cannot be a humanitarian organization without resolving or attempting to resolve disparities in healthcare and disparities of inclusion, disparities in, in access. Uh, so that's, that is something that we've embedded in all of our activities in the Urology Care Foundation. And lastly, Dr. DeVries, what do you hope people will take away from your work? I hope they see opportunity. Many, many people have expressed for over the years, a desire to do this kind of work. They've just not known how. The AUA has now established an endowment, well, actually several endowments that will help to support people doing this work. That I think will help, especially the people young in their careers who may not have scholarships, but uh, don't want to wait till they retire. This will encourage people at different stages of their career to get out and to, to serve in communities within the United States, but also in underserved countries. Dr. DeVries and Dr. Nagler, thank you both so much for joining us today. Pleasure to be with you. Well, thank you for having me. This is a pleasure. Next, let's take a closer look at the challenges faced around the world in urology and what the AUA has been doing to help its global community. As the world continues to deal with the COVID-19 global pandemic, it's been inspiring to see how the global urologic community is responding to the immense challenges before us. 
Despite these challenges, the dedication and commitment of our members to provide the highest quality of care to our patients has shown brightly through the clouds of uncertainty. Just as many of our colleagues have done over the last year, the AUA made the difficult decision to pivot our annual meeting to a virtual format. The pandemic continues to change the face of education, but I'm confident that we have provided our members with the highest quality program that they are accustomed to receiving from the AUA despite our challenges. I'm pleased to share that our entire plenary is available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. In addition, the CAO and the Brazilian Portuguese programs are being translated into Spanish and Portuguese respectively. And the AUCA program from our friends in Latin, Central America and the Caribbean is presented in Spanish. Our scientific program also includes wonderful programs from our colleagues at the Japanese Urological Association, the Korean Urological Association, and the Maghreb Federation of Urology. The AUA annual meeting is truly a global event and brings together the best science from around the world. Our international colleagues are featured throughout the meeting and are an integral part of the entire academic program. Whether it is the plenary, instructional courses, abstracts, or society programs, the diversity of the global urologic community is well represented. Our plenary also includes the multinational society lectures from our esteemed colleagues from the European Association of Urology, the CAO in Latin America, the SIU, and the Urological Association of Asia lectures. Finally, I would like to share that I, along with the three AUA Assistant Secretaries, have been keeping engaged with our international society partners by holding virtual leadership meetings so that we can check in on our friends and partners, learn about their challenges, share experiences, and continue to move forward with our educational collaborations. It has been wonderful to see so many of our friends and partners virtually. While I, of course, long to see our colleagues face-to-face -face once it is safe, we've managed to continue to strengthen our global partnerships. We certainly learned a lot from each other these past 18 months. I would like to thank all of my colleagues around the world for their support and engagement with the AUA. It is because of you that the AUA continues to be the global leader in neurology. I look forward to engaging with you during our meeting, and I certainly hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Now let's dive into our tour of organizations around the world that are leading in the field of urology. The urologic oncology team at Mass General Hospital has taken the collaborative team approach to patient care to a new level. And MGH patients are testifying to the relief they feel and confidence they have in this multidisciplinary team. Let's take a closer look. This is an amazingly exciting time to be in this field. One of the great things about MGH Urology is that we cover really all the aspects of urology. Our urologic oncology group is a special section within our department. We approach almost all urologic malignancies in a multidisciplinary manner. And the reason why is that a lot of cancers require different forms of treatment, not just one. One of the really neat things that exemplifies how we work together is our uh, multidisciplinary uh, oncology conference. So we meet uh, twice a month and we'll have 50 people in the room at any given time. You get to come up with a collaborative opinion as well as a collaborative game plan. We do this for everybody. You know, we do this for every patient even if they're not a complicated case, even if they're a very simple, straightforward case, we do this for everyone. The more minds, the better, I believe, for the patient. I love being at Mass General, and it's incredibly exciting to think about what's on the horizon. Over the past decade, Chesapeake Urology established a groundbreaking continuum of care operating model for urology and became the largest practice in the Mid-Atlantic region. Today, as a managed services organization, United Urology Group is bringing the urology-specific continuum of care model across the nation. Let's take a closer look. United Urology Group is the country's leading urology management service organization, or MSO. We are led by physicians, and a high percentage of the MSO is owned by physicians. UUG affiliate practices span five states. 
Arizona, Colorado, Maryland, Tennessee, and Delaware. We currently have over 1,600 dedicated and compassionate employees, over 80 locations, over 225 physicians and advanced practitioners, and we're closing in on nearly 1 million patient encounters per year. Today, running a medical practice is very challenging. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. We're existing across five states with different laws, regulations. But the bottom line is our goal is to provide the highest level of urologic care no matter where we are in the country. And the MSO support from United Urology Group allows the physicians to practice at their highest level at all times. Profound Medical is dedicated to enhancing patients' quality of life by delivering incision-free ablative interventions utilizing real-time vision, RTV, where they are expanding physicians' options to deliver ablative therapies that are customizable to their patients' needs. Let's take a closer look. The Tulsa system itself is very easy to use. You have a pretty good idea of what you're doing, why, how the system works. The feedback is, is easy to use. A treatment option with a lower risk of side effects is very, very attractive to men who are interested in reducing their chance of death from prostate cancer, but at the of quality of life. Today's plenaries are covering fascinating work in bladder cancer treatment and kidney stones. Let's hear from our speakers about what they'll be covering in their talks. I'm Isla Skinner from the Department of Urology at Stanford University. I'm going to be talking about the bladder cancer and where we've come from the last 30 years. There have been some really critical developments that have changed the landscape. The TCGA project and major efforts by multiple investigators have shed light on the biology of the disease, showing us that bladder cancer is not one tumor, but actually multiple subtypes that have different prognosis and may have different response to therapies. The challenge is to keep our focus on what our patients are really looking for and to get to the goal of truly personalized medicine. Can we pinpoint prognosis down to the individual patient? and actually guide our treatment so that we give only the patients the treatment that's actually gonna work. Can we find a way to replace cystoscopy with a urine test? Can we improve the accuracy of our imaging to really tell us where the cancer is so that we can guide our therapy that way? And although we would love to eliminate the need for cystectomy, can we continue to make that a safer operation? And is an ileal conduit really the best we can do for our patients who need that potentially life-saving life treatment? And finally, can we use our newfound ability to subtype these tumors to really drive our treatment decisions down to the personal level? I think the next three decades, we will not recognize our treatment for this disease, but I think we should be proud of how we've uh, come so far. I am Glenn Preminger from Duke University and I'm truly honored to give the 2021 Latimer Lecture, where I will talk about the future directions in medical stone management. I will highlight empiric treatments such as smart water bottles and diet supplements. I will describe new uses of old medications, such as the use of potassium or sodium bicarbonate in patients unable to tolerate or afford potassium citrate. I will focus on medications to reduce urinary oxalate, not only in patients with enteric hyperoxaluria, but for all calcium oxalate stone formers. And finally, I will introduce the diagnostic developments in the genomic diagnosis and genetic therapy of patients with recurrent stones, ultimately, potentially 
leading to a genetic treatment of patients with monogenic stone disorders. Our tour of teams leading in the field of urology continues. Urology of Virginia is a highly specialized and globally renowned urology practice with a long history of providing comprehensive, compassionate, and quality urologic care to the Hampton Roads community and beyond. From the establishment of the first practice, Divine Urology in 1922, to the 1997 merger of seven Hampton Roads urology practices, the long history of quality, innovation, and growth continues today. Urology of Virginia is a urology practice that is community as well as academic based. We specialize in oncology, general urology, reconstructive surgery, stone center. In addition, we provide urologic care to the Hampton Roads community. We are different than other practices because we have both an academic as well as a community focus. So we are a private practice that is also faculty at Eastern Virginia Medical School. For patients, this is the best of both worlds. You have your urologist in your backyard, someone in your community, but you also have access to all of the innovations, the education, and the clinical trials that are available in academics. It's an incredible heritage and, uh, and a great history of innovation and a culture of education, but we also have a responsibility as really the sole urology providers for our community and our catchment area of, of almost two million people. And so I think that fusion of the community provider with the academic uh, education focused uh, innovative group is, uh, is really a special thing that we have here. Prostate cancer screening is a critical component of early detection and cure for the tens of thousands of men who die every year from this disease. Defining a population of men who would benefit most from this practice is critical. The Prompt Prostate Genetic Score, PGS, is a major advancement in defining risk for prostate cancer. We sought to save prostate cancer screening by defining high-risk populations of men who A, deserve to know that they're at high risk, and B, the right to be screened for their prostate cancers. The test is based on single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, and these are single base pair genetic changes. There are over 300 million of these SNPs throughout the human genome, and we've identified several dozens of these genetic changes which are associated with prostate cancer. We then test you for those different genetic changes and we put it into an algorithm and it spits out a score. So then we identify men who are at below average, average and above average risk. We can measure polygenomic risk score in a child or in an adult and it's completely stable because these are just the inherited single nucleotide polymorphisms we get from our parents. One of the exciting things we can do is measure the score in people with a family history. And some of those sons will have below average risk, some of them will have above average risk, and we can actually adjust our screening behavior based on that risk. Thanks again for joining us today. We'll be back again tomorrow with more exclusive material from the 2021 AUA Virtual Meeting. We'll see you tomorrow.